All right. My name is Wynn, and uh, I'm a security guy. And I'm going to be talking about some problems that I've noticed in the last few years. But before I do that, I'm going to do a crash, crass, crass commercial plug for my latest project, and I want everybody's support on it. Uh, we got to get kids and families fixed. <laughs> so, so we have a Kickstarter project. Just, just pass them out. Yeah, that's me. That's me. And spread the word, all the support that our Kickstarter project can get. End of Crass uh, commercial plug. Just hand them on out. Get everybody involved because it really, really matters. And we're really kicking the thing off on uh, Monday and Tuesday this week. We were going to do it earlier, but an election and a storm got in the way. So, at any rate, uh, Hiring the unhirable, we've got uh, some major problems, and I tend to believe that they begin at the top of our government. Uh, Napolitano says, we cannot find enough really good security people, and I'm saying bullshit. That's just not true. Uh, Dernsa, director of the NSA, was out at DEF CON and said, you guys are the greatest security people around. And... There was a zero-day day hacking contest, and a 12-year-old girl won the damn thing. But she's probably unhirable by any measure of standards that we've got today. So I'm going to look at this from a discrimination standpoint, that we are actually being discriminated against, and there's going to be some legal outcome from this over the next several years. But it starts back in 1969. That's not funny. And I was, no, that was not Al Gore. He was, he was off with Tommy Lee Jones doing wicked weed. I wanted to get a job. I wanted to get, work for the greatest company known to man to become a researcher, have them pay for my education. And what com company was that? IBM? No. What was the greatest research company in the late 60s? Ma Bell, Bell Labs. I wanted to go to work for Bell Labs. And they were going to pay for my education, and I was going to learn how to be a great researcher. So I go down to the HR department on 56th Street and Madison Avenue in New York. And I pass the I can speak English test and I know math test and all the other kind of crap that goes with it. And everything's all laid out. I'm going to have this great career, great education. And there was only one more test. Now back in those days, we didn't have fiber. We had 2,048 pair cables that we wired the telephones with. The lady gave me a pair of wires and said, what color are they? I'm colorblind. I was unhirable in those days because I was colorblind. Very for, it was early form of discrimination. So I cried a little bit and went across the street on the other side of Madison Avenue to the second best company to go to work for in those days, which was IBM, and they were going to pay for my education and it put me through uh, all the training, and I was going to become a great researcher up in Armonk, New York. So I passed the I can speak English test, I know math test, I'd already built my first computers, done all that stuff. And at the end of it, you're hired. Only one more thing. I had to look like him. They wanted me to look like Ross Perot. So that was a deal breaker. And I went into the music business and became an engineer and producer instead. But both of these were discriminatory practices by almost any standards we'd go by with today. And today, we have an entirely new set of discriminatory practices that are occurring at the part of HR at the behest of the lawyers. And at the end of this, are there any lawyers here by any chance? Seriously? Then we need your help. We really need your help. I want your help. Maybe not. Maybe you suck. I don't know. I don't know the dude. <laughs> maybe he's good. Maybe he's not. But we've got a lot of discrimination going on. We're going to go through how can we get around this and what do we need to do. Number one, we've got to recognize, or they've got to recognize, that we're not all created equal. Everybody has specialties. Anybody who claims to be a security expert and knows everything, what do you do with somebody like that? Run like hell is the correct answer, because none of us know everything. We all have our little niches, little specialties, and what we should know how to do, all of us, really, really, really well, is know how to reach somebody else that knows how to answer the question that we need answered. It's how do you get the information that you need. But we're all created completely differently. And so what's normal? 
by today's standards, we're probably a little bit closer to the black and white picture over on the left versus the girl with the dragon on the right, but things are shifting a little bit in certain areas, but not within corporate America, not within government uh, organizations that are trying to hire so-called security experts to save networks and nations. And we then have to default to standard deviations. Where does everybody sit? And we tend to look, and government and corporate America look in the middle. They want the normal people, whatever normal means. However, when we look at geeks, when we look at people that really understand this whole space, and they were talking earlier about we're going to do this cool stuff with toys, or we're going to do this cool stuff for people that have certain limitations. It wasn't originally designed that way, but we are the outliers sitting on the outside of these curves. And typically, it becomes very, very difficult for us to get jobs. But as in anything else, we just went through a very painful election. This has to change at the very, very top, at leadership. Now, this little video up here I'm going to show you, prob we've all probably seen or been hired or worked with somebody that meets these criteria. I'm going to put you in IT, because you said on your CV you have a lot of experience with computers. <laughs> I did say that on my CV, yes. <laughs> I have a lot of experience with the whole computer thing, you know, emails. Sending emails, uh, receiving emails, <laughs> deleting emails. Um, I could go on. Do. The web. Using mouse, mices, using mice. Um, clicking, double clicking. Um, the computer screen, of course, the keyboard, the bit that goes on the floor down there. The hard drive. Correct. Uh huh. Well, you certainly seem to know your stuff. <laughs> How often does management tend to fall into that level of knowledge and they're the ones who are supposed to be hiring folks like us that are in theory understand what we're doing. Huge disconnect going on and especially in, as I'll show you in part of the hiring process. What we forget is we should begin with skills. Corporate America, government needs to begin with skill sets, not some of these arbitrary discriminators that we're currently using. Uh, in all sectors, not only in the U.S., but certainly uh, in Europe as well, from my experiences. So we need to realize that there's different levels of skills, and one security guy, just because you know how to configure a firewall, does not mean you know how to code in uh, assembly language. And we all understand these discriminators and who kind of knows what. So it makes it a lot easier for us, but it's very difficult for HR when they're using binary discriminators in order to filter people out that do not fit that middle, middle place of norm. First thing we've got to do is forget about these degrees. Why do, do we have to have a bachelor's degree in Chaucerian English in order to be able to get hired as a security guy, even though I may have umpteen credentials behind me? So we use this as an arbitrary discriminator to say you have to have a bachelor's, you have to have a master's, and how many jobs do have we seen that say I need a really, really good security guy degree required? Doesn't well, and what is the extent, what, what's the effect of that? That right now government in America and business are not hiring the people that they need because it's an arbitrary discriminator in order to be able to say no. You don't fit down the norm. And that is something I'm arguing against. Certifications. If you don't have a CISSP, you can obviously not know anything about security. Or if you don't have a degree uh, from Cisco University or Microsoft University, you can know, know, know nothing. Each one of these is a checkbox. It's a validation to some degree meaning something. But by itself, should it be a standalone discriminator? If you don't have one of these checkboxes, should you automatically be tossed out of the HR and hiring process? And I'm arguing no, that we're not looking at skills first. When I go to DEF CON, when you go to DEF CON or any CON, how long does it take you to determine if the person you're talking to knows his shit? How long? Not long is not a number. How long? 120 seconds, 60 seconds, 30 seconds. You get a pretty good idea if you want to go to the next level and take it down to the five-minute level. Skills first, abilities first, 
and HR does not have that. So they revert back to these other arbitrary discriminators because they got nothing else because they don't have the skills to be able to do it and we end up with management people that were like in that video. We don't teach security history. And what does that mean? That means we're doomed to be making the same damn mistakes all over again. And what area are we doing that exactly today? Where are we making exactly the same mistakes starting in 2007 that we started making back in 1981? <laughs> mobile. Think about what we're doing with mobile. Inherently, insecure devices, C-level folks are saying, thou shalt put them into our enterprise securely, but the fundamental technology does not allow it, does not lend itself from the consumerized devices to work in a professional IT environment for all sorts of cool technical reasons we don't get into. But we're not teaching where we've been. We're not teaching the new guys that are coming along in the field what it was RACF like, what was ACF2 like, what was asynchronous controls like versus bisynchronous controls that we're using today in a time. Do we need firewalls? What are the successes and failures? And we have all the models, we have all the data, but we're not teaching it. We're teaching to the test. Anybody here a CISSP? Okay, yeah, we te they all teach to the test. I cannot pass a CISSP because I disagree with 40% of the answers in there. And they tried to give me a pass on it, and I said, no, I'm not going to do it because I don't agree. And I do a lot of work with ISC squared, and I don't diss them or versus anybody else. But at the same time, by it, all by itself, it's a discriminator that should not be used. We need to get politically incorrect if we're going to solve our network security problems and the network security infrastructure problems that we're facing at the national level. Number one, we've got to teach our kids they're nothing special. Nothing special at all. Helicopter parents, we've all seen them. Oh, little Joey, you're a great soccer player, you're great at math, and you're a great scientist, and you're going to be president of the United States. Bullshit. Sorry, you suck at soccer. Go have a ball with it. Have fun with it, but you're not going to be any really good at it. But maybe you're a really good geek. Maybe you've got some other skills. Parents and schools are teaching to the test, trying to make everybody equal, fit into this equal box, instead of finding the acumens and the talents that people have and then using them and trying to develop those so they fit into the right places. And in our space, we don't begin a kindergarten. We don't find our kindergarten geeks and our three-year-old geeks and our 10-year-old geeks to the extent that we really should. And I'm arguing that we have to get over this helicopter parent issue and realize there's good, there's bad, there's adequate, and then there's frickin' awesome. But people that are frickin' awesome at stuff have other issues that we have to deal with. We need to teach and embrace failure. How else can you learn if you don't fail? Thomas Edison didn't learn how to make a light bulb. He found 2,000 ways not to make a light bulb. Every bit of it highly valuable in education to understand what works, what doesn't work. And ultimately, success is, in fact, 99% failure. How can you succeed unless you know what failure is and have experienced it and be able to make those discriminatory things, those, those uh, discrimina discriminations between what is going to work and not going to work? So we need to build this into our educational system at all levels. So I ask a question. You're laughing at the words, let's quit reading the damn slides. <laughs> so failure. I, when I was in the record business, we were down in Jamaica with Stevie Wonder and Bob Marley. And we had 80,000 people for this grand concert. And it was absolutely awesome. We got the lighting and the sound. But at that time, it was a political rebellion, 1976, in, in Jamaica. And it was the Brits with the politics, the Chinese with the money, the native Jamaicans who wanted their country back, and everybody was kind of at almost a civil war. So we decided to go down and put on a concert, which was really smart. So we had the lighting and everything, and about halfway through, suddenly all the sound dies and all the lighting dies. The hell do you do? And so we're all kind of like doing our normal, all right, here are the routines and things that we need to check. And one of the grunts, the roadies, says, I know what it is. And he grabs a canister, a fire extinguisher, runs over to a pole transformer by the lights and starts shooting CO2 on it. He gets arrested for terrorism, but he cooled the transformer down enough to give us our power back so we could redistribute the load. I learned from failure. Now, what does corporate America and HR want? 
They want. Do you know how to configure a firewall? Do you know how to configure a router? Do you know how to make all of this stuff and make 2003 and 2007 and server 2010? Can you make it work perfectly? Sure, I've never had a problem in my life. You're hired, son, versus shit, every time I get by one, something craps out and I have to spend all night making it work. What do we really need in our environments? This stuff's going to fail. It's go anybody can make it work when it works. But when it breaks is when things really matter. We don't teach this at any level in our educational system or in our certification systems for CompSci. Now we've got to go to the autism spectrum. How many of you have some degree of Asperger's syndrome? How many of you are in denial? <laughs> All geeks have a degree of Asperger's. We're on the autism scale. It means we can sit and focus for 37 hours until the problem is solved. By definition, that puts us on the scale. Not being able to, not being able to pay attention to anything other than this, the hyperfocus, ADHD, all of these are on the spectrum, yet these are discriminatory filters from HR. Oh, you've got something wrong with you. We can't, we can't do that. We can't have you in here because you're not normal. You don't fit. Now, maybe after some drugs and some psych work, maybe we can let you in. I got a guy who works for me in one of my companies. I worked for him, I guess, four years. I've met him once. I said hello to him. He never answered. He puts out a half a million lines of code a year. The guy is frickin' brilliant, but I'm not gonna let him near human beings either. <laughs> we keep him over there, and there's one person that can manage him. These are the kinds of people that we often really, really want, especially when the shit goes down inside of an organization, and you got a problem to solve, and you got who you gonna call. You gonna call your nine-to-fiver guy? who just graduated 90 days ago from a CS program with a 4.0 and he doesn't know what a JPEG is? Or are you going to get your autistic guy who's never had a degree, never made it through high school, and he says, give me three hours. You'll be good. And they hold up to this. So we need to reevaluate what we're doing. All the great minds. Tesla. I'm a huge Tesla fan. He was completely crazy, ADHD, OCD, M-O-U-S-E, all of that kind of crap, and he could not get hired. He barely got hired by, uh, by Edison before Edison totally screwed him over because he was so different, and Edison had his own issues of ADHD. So... If you ever want the slides, let me know, and I can forward all this to you, or you can sit here and we can read every single word of it right now. Your call. Next. Okay. So you, then the argument is from corporate America, well, I can't trust these guys. Really? You can't trust these guys. Well, how do you determine who you can trust? And today it's done through arbitrary kinds of discriminators, which are fairly meaningless. They check your credit. All right. You don't owe a gazillion dollars, fair enough. You've never been arrested, cool. The hell does it mean if you've never been arrested? What does that mean, sir? What does it mean? Shit, well, that's not exactly what I was looking. You've never been caught is exactly it. That's all it means. And so we, we vet people to the degree of, if we haven't already done something wrong, haven't been caught, therefore, now you're trustworthy. And this is part of the basis, and I'm saying, nah, it's bullshit, complete bullshit. What we need to do is go, we profile for a living. That's what security geeks do. We need to profile people. Now, I don't mean black, white, muzzle. I don't mean any of that. For those of you that are not familiar with Dr. Paul Ekman's work, they made a TV show out of it called Lie to Me, and it's about micro-expressions, and the science is probably 10 years old now. That's it. And go to paulekman.com. You can take the online microexpressions deception course for $79. It's really cool. I just started it. And you start being able to determine when people are being deceptive, which is the only thing we really care about. So during a hiring process, HR is going to go to their typical binary functions. And I'm much more interested in 
the analog function, the behavior, the tendencies, the proclivities of the individual I'm talking to. And one of the questions that I might want to ask is, if somebody kidnaps your wife and daughter, will you potentially go rogue on my company? And any other answer is going to be a lie. And you've got to shift these questions to be able to, and these guys do this stuff for a living. I don't do it for a living. But the skill sets are there, and it's called industrial psychological profiling and deception detection. Nothing magic here. And it is far superior to doing any sort of GSR, any sort of uh, light detector testing, because it's involuntary musculature movement by and large. Again, take a look at Ekman's stuff. So we have the same problem with TSA. TSA assumes that every grandmother has got bombs in her prosthetics. No, 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 you've got, there's other ways of doing this. Anybody been to Europe? Okay, and what is security like at a European airport? No, it's not. The other thing that happens in a European airport, as soon as you walk into the airport, the first thing you do is there's this really good-looking guy or girl, early 20s, with a big smile on their face. They're not going to give you a fries. And they say, hi, where are you? And I just start chatting. I said, I bet you're the people who are going to look for the X, Y, to see which way I'm smiling and not smiling, to see if I've actually got something bad with me, aren't you? And in Europe, they took the LL model looking for deception. It works. We chose not to, and we also choose not to because of political correctness inside of the HR workplace because we have to treat everybody equal, which then gives us the teach to the test, and we're back to the same set of problems. However, it is okay to let certain people in. We can let in the chief of CIA counterintelligence against the Soviets who worked for the Soviets, the head of the FBI counter-Soviet intelligence who worked for the Soviets, and we couldn't find them because we're being politically correct instead of being efficient. We've got to redefine clearances, and this applies more to the government. Right now we're using a binary mold that came out of the Cold War, and the original secrets were very, very simple. We had nuclear secrets and military secrets. The third secrets that came up after that were cryptography in the early 1950s. We thought we had some sort of uh, ownership of it all, but the Russians were way ahead of us because they adapted the old German models. Redefine clearances. Just because you want to defend a firewall, a network, a database inside of an organization, does that mean you have to have the same level of clearance that somebody is going to be running bombing missions needs. And I'm saying, no, we need to have a new set of trust that's established based upon the actual needs of the architecture of the networked organization. We don't have it, and the government hates this. I gave a talk to the FBI, about 500 of them, in East Tennessee recently. I got a letter back. They said, your talk was absolutely awesome. You succeeded in pissing every single person off. So it meant I was saying something correct. We have to really re-examine how we're going to do clearances if we're going to get and allow the right people in to do the jobs. We're saying no to some of the greatest geeks around because, because they, a friend of mine, a friend of mine end, ended up owing the IRS a couple hundred thousand dollars because it was one of these stock deals that went bad. He ended up with stock and it ended up had a, it was an ordinary income thing. The stock tanked before the buyout and he saddled with this ridiculous amount of IRS tax burden for no good reason other than whatever the tax laws are. But because of that, he cannot go to work for the feds because now he's a security risk because he owes the IRS money for something that he did not cause. Like for another friend of mine, he's got friends that are a, a cocaine dealers in jail. God can't hire you either because you might see your brother up at Sing Sing or wherever the hell he is. Arbitrary discriminators instead of using the proper types of deception profiling across the people. Now, Raytheon actually was able to bypass some of this. And I gave it the keynote at DHS, the DHS uh, National Conference so a couple months ago. And Raytheon was saying, how the hell did you find out about that? Nobody's, and so now DHS is having a talk with Raytheon, but Raytheon was realizing that they needed to get the right people, and they said, we're going to bypass the conventional process by subcontracting out to a subcontractor to get the right people so they don't have to then pass the same level of stringent clearance materials and regulations that they would if they were in the prime. 
So there are a couple ways around it, but boy, then you have 20% markup here, 30% markup here, and you're back to uh, insane monies in order to be able to bypass a process that does not really mean a whole lot these days. I was uh, at DEF CON at the roof party at the top of the Rio just this last August. I'm talking to a friend of mine working for uh, one of the defense contractors. He says, I need a guy, and I need him to be able to do that. And I said, oh, shit, I think he's right over there. So I went and grabbed a guy, I had a beer, and they got to talking. And they go, okay, you got the skills. And I did one of those five-minute talks to get him past the initials. And so the big guy finally says, he says, uh, what is it about you that could make you potentially unhirable? Better to let me know right now. He goes, I'm Canadian. Which means he could not go to work for the defense contractor without five years of paperwork in order to prove that he was not a terrorist. So again, we've got our special relationships with our friends in the UK. We've got Canada, Canada Stan. We've got Australia Stan. We've got all these places that we cannot co-op outside of very structured, high-level clearance organizations where they do have reciprocity. Otherwise, these guys are out. Well, at the military level, yes, because there's reciprocity inside of many of those organizations within the military organizations. And it's not something that can go, hi, you're a really good geek, come to work for me tomorrow. It's one of these 180-day, two-year processes of the kind of vetting so they know what you did and what your kindergarten teacher smoked. I mean, <laughs> oh, they do. And, the, and many of them, are, I mean, how many people here could pass a lifestyle poly? Yeah, with some of your half hands up, right? Yeah, right. I don't know that. That's part of what the profiling and industrial, industrial psychological interviews are all about. Hey, if a government comes along, are, they, are you going to do it? I'm going to look for his answer, and he's going to not know that his body language and his micro-expressions, it's the, those experts. You can look at code. You can look at behavior of a network and tell what's normal and not. Other people can do the same thing with human beings. Uh, the, the success rate with this is... a way beyond uh, what's being done with uh, polygraphs, way beyond it. Is anything perfect? No. Is it far better? Yes, in, certainly in my opinion. Yes, sir. The Israelis are the ones who probably pioneered this. Ekman happens to be Jewish, of course, but the Israelis pioneered it, and they were using it, and it became popularized in the West after the Munich massacre uh, at the Olympics in 1972, when the Europeans said, help what do we do and they went to the people that knew how to profile and defend themselves the best because el al to this day has never had a security issue on their airplanes and that's why uh, eu went to them so take some of the people that we know can they pass a personality test and you may have read about this recently a girl 22 year old is suing target right now because she failed the personality test to be a checkout bagger. Failed a personality test. So when we look at some of the geeks that we know, or you look at yourself in the mirror, can everybody turn their personality on to satisfy HR? No. HR is going to be discriminating based upon personality. Some of it is going to be highly arbitrary, and if somebody's sitting there with a tick, like doing this every couple seconds, they may be able to code, 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 code great, but they can't interact, and that's going to get them out. So again, personality tests have to be removed from the equation as an absolute discriminator, just one piece of the puzzle. Lots of discriminators are being used. Uh, ageism, I probably couldn't get a job anywhere in the world right now because I'm approaching 102 years old, so fat chance of me getting there. Uh, but so they often now are kicking out the old people. Great. So I, I just had a meeting with some folks out of Miami. The, these guys are in their mid 50s, and they're getting ready for forced retirement. But they got 30 years of experience behind them. 
So what we're fundamentally saying is, okay, you're 58, you are now kicked out, we're not going to call you, don't call us, we got a 22-year-old that just came out of school and he will take care of everything for us. Is that an adequate response? And I'm arguing no. In the academic world, we have the concept of emeritus, that, okay, you let the guy go off a little, but he doesn't disappear. There is a transfer, a brain trust transfer of his knowledge of when things go wrong. The shit just hit the fan. Call Bob. Bob went through this three times, 12 years ago. We're screwing ourselves because of the way that we run our organizations now. And we have to have a better process for the exodus and transition of the expertise, especially when people are getting older and older. Uh, personality, HR, some people just don't like you. There's just personality clash, HR person, Bam, you walk in the room, bam, bad vibes. It's like hanging out with the Dementors from Harry Potter. Just not going to work. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. And that's why the first level I go back to in the earlier slides, first ought to be skills first. Skills have to come first before we get uh, into any of these other types of issues. 9 to 5, okay, you show up at 9 o'clock, turn on your creative ADHD Asperger's gene, and leave at 5 and bring it back and do it again tomorrow morning. That's going to work, isn't it? That works for all of us. I know what happens with, with me at home. My wife and I are watching TV or a football game. It's about 11. She says, oh, let's go to bed. And I go, I got an idea. I'll go to my office. How long are you going to be? Oh, hon, I'll be 20 minutes max. And then as the sun comes up, right? We've, we've all been through this. We cannot live nine to five. Yeah, there's some things you got to do. You got to cope with some of it. But by and large, that's not where our skill sets lie. They lie with the creativity that we have and the urgency of the situation that presents itself to us. Stop drug testing. My God. We have to get over some of the stuff. What is it? Colorado just got over it. Washington State just got over it. And now it's okay to have absolute raging alcoholics go through 12 types of rehab, maintain top secret clearances, but if you do a doob on the weekend and are honest about it, you're out. It's idiotic. And I, somebody in one of the media, uh, after one of these presentations, said, oh, Schwartow just wants to hire heroin addicts. No, Jesus, you're an idiot media person. It's about a balance. Does it affect the job? Does it matter? And the military did it fairly well. Don't ask, don't tell, until it becomes an issue. And if you've got an alcoholic that's in rehab three times, put him on, put him away. P -p get rid of him. He is your trouble. He is the, it's an abusive personality syndrome much more than it is. What is your recreational drug of choice? At least that's my argument. And by and large, I don't think any of us know anybody that has ever smoked pot and they all get completely crazy, and there's massive pot fights at every pot bar, right? Yeah, well, everybody that's been to Amsterdam knows that's true, too. So we got to redefine what we're talking about, and it looks like politically maybe we're finally starting to get there. Kids are saying no to a lot of this stuff. My son uh, did his first national television at 11, when he was doing a demonstration of how to break into networks using a Pringles can in the early days of Wi-Fi. And little short kid brush cut and all that. He got recruited by the NSA, along with a couple of other of his, his friends from one of the smart schools. And he got a scholarship to Boston University. And it was all on track to go become an uber geek for NSA and all those kind of guys, because he was going to have all the toys and all the cool stuff. Get it. Three weeks into the process, he and his buddies call and said, we're not going to finish it. You're only three weeks into it. They go, yeah, well, we did some research. Smart kids, research. Fair enough. What'd you find out? The NSA is going to want us to go straight, have to cut our hair, and we have to be all of these things that we're not, and we're not going to be able to have any fun. We're going to have to live by their rules and their boxes, and suddenly everything that we're all about and we grew up learning about and hacking goes out the window. Can't do it. The entire class quit. And because of a lot of these restrictions, we're losing some of the best and brightest talent because of the nature of the restrictive behavior and the Cold War mindset that is still being adhered to, especially inside the government. Now, we're competing for skills, though. So just saying no 
is even making it worse. Okay, we've got the financial sector, and we've got the private sector, we've got Europe, Asia. All these private sector guys are competing for skills. Then you get the governments competing for skills. And they're crying that there's not enough folks out there, but uh, for, for those of you who have been to DEF CON, there's 15,000 people out there, and an awful lot of them can't get jobs because of some of the reasons I'm mentioning here. So where do they go to work? The bad guys. Bad guys don't care what drugs you do, what you look like, what your history is, what your psychological proclivities are. Only thing they give a shit about is what? Deliver the hostile code we're paying you for. That's all they care about. So we have a different balance of what is going to end up happening with the skilled people, whether it's in the U.S., Asia, or Europe. They're going to find some way to make money, one way or another. And because of our discriminatory practices, we're losing an awful lot of them to the dark side. And whether it's in the criminal side or it's at the nation state side, somebody's going to pick up if they have skills because they do have the skills first mindset. So if we decide to hire the unhirables inside of organizations, what do we have to do? What do we as the man then have to do in order to make them fit into the organization? Well, number one, let them go to hacker cons all they want. This is how we learn. We sit there, drink mass quantities of beer, meet some cool people, hack a little, don't sleep for three days, and then we have a brand new page in our Rolodex. Rolodex. Anybody remember Rol? Yeah, okay, that word still translates. I don't know. And we got to just, whenever they want to go, let them go. They got to learn how to own their own IP. And this has been a problem and still is a legal problem inside of so many organizations. You sign up, you're a developer, everything you create is ours. Even if you create it at home on your time, it's ours. That's just fundamentally wrong. So you go to work for a big company, you're working on a big project, the big project stuff is theirs. No disagreement there. However, you're a smart guy, and at 4 a.m. in the morning, you say, "Hun, I'll be right back. You had an idea to build a little tool to make your job easier. You should be able to own that tool. That's yours. You made it at 4 in the morning, ignoring your wife, made your job easier that's going to allow them to own the rest of the IP. We need to be able to restructure it and give something back to the geeks. We don't have the support systems for the people we can't hire. If we can support alcoholics, and we can support rehab, and we can support all these other things, and we can support people in wheelchairs and with various other disabilities, my argument is many of the disabilities and many of the discriminators that are being used today in this presentation are medical in nature. And if they're medical in nature, how come we're discriminating against those but not other ones? Where is the balance? Where is the fairness in this? And this is where I call upon lawyers, and I call upon them in every session I've done, help us find a way to determine how to make some of these things that are currently arbitrary discriminators against the law. And this is declaring war on human resources around the country. Get rid of meetings. We don't need too many meetings. We know how to code. Give people access to the technology. If uh, you've got some really cool technology at the back end, let, let, let your uber geeks have some fun with it in a controlled sandbox environment. Yeah, all the kind of good stuff. We tend to care probably more about the security of it than our host company would anyway. Anybody see what happened to the Security and Exchange Commission today? Nobody? They got hacked. They got hacked with unencrypted stock exchange records. Gazillions of them and nobody knows where, how, or by whom yet came out this morning. So the argument is, again, give people access to the stuff and let them hack at it. Because unless you know how to attack, you don't know how to defend. And organizations need to be able to have attack centers. Black, blue, red, black, red, I'm sorry, blue, white, blue, red, black, red centers inside the organizations to let the geeks at it. Not just benign pen testing, some really hostile shit. That's the real world. Benign pen testing does not echo what the bad guys are doing. We need to give the people the tools that they need to be able to come up with new levels of defense. And what should the companies expect? Social awkwardness, brutal honesty. Geeks are not going to tell you or should not be telling you what you want to hear. They should be telling you 
what they honestly believe and think based upon their experiences. You're going to get all sorts of different characteristics from this community, just like you see at this con or DEF CON or any of the others. People are very, very brutal, very, very honest, and just you got to deal with it. So people got to get over this crap. This one's got to get over a lot of crap, too. Oh, God. You see that call for revolution he did after Obama get elected? It's like, seriously, you didn't get arrested for that? Jesus. Got to get over some of this stuff, and we need to embrace some lawyers to be able to help us get this job done. And in this case, I'm not a lawyer fan, but we need the lawyers, because the lawyers are the ones who created this mess of political correctness. And the lawyers need to help us get out of this mess to be able to provide us with some real ways to get things done and to find a way. And I challenge them. I've challenged the DHS lawyers. I've challenged the FBI lawyers. You have found a way to say no. I want you to find a way to say yes. I want you to find a way legally, get on the other side. We, the way our legal system works, it's one of conflict. That's the nature of the beast. You have succumbed to the I want to say no syndrome instead of the I want to find a way to make it work syndrome. I heard one group say it's too damned hard. <laughs> well, then get out of the room. I'm sorry. We made it to the moon. We built a bomb in six years. This country's done some amazing things technologically given the freedom to do it. Oppenheimer could not get hired today. By today's standards, he could not be hired. Whether he was or wasn't doesn't matter. He did the damn job, and they had surveillance on top of him all day long as well because they were suspicious. And he lost TS, and then you go to Alan Turing. Alan Turing lost it because he was gay. And by today's standards, these are unacceptable, the same way that Asperger's discrimination should be unacceptable. Some of the other characteristics I'm talking about that have medical basises should be unacceptable in a modern society. It's not too hard. It's just that we have found it much easier to say no than to find ways to say yes. And I'm just not a fan of finding excuses. Geeks are not fan, fans of finding excuses. Your boss who says fix it doesn't want to hear excuses either. And we have to get this filtered all the way up and all the way down through corporate America and our educational system. So there's my crass commercial plug again. That's my high-level pitch on hiring the unhirable. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Otherwise, I'm going to go home. And yes, sir. Getting involved in a Bradley, I mean, I think Bradley Manning is not, I'm talking about it from a technical issue, not a social issue. You're bringing up a social issue of somebody who had access to massive amounts of data, and then he acted inappropriately according to the law. The majority of geeks take pride in what they do, and again, part of the vetting process, part of the hiring process, are you going to be a Bradley, and again, I don't have all the answers on the hiring question. Are you going to go Bradley Manning on me? Where are your triggers? Where are your proclivities? And my job as the profiler of you is to understand your stress points and where your allegiances really are. Are you really that pro-Muslim you're going to go rogue on me? Or you just wear a turban because you like to stuff your Uzi in it? I don't know what the answer is. What? That wasn't funny. That wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, a, it's about understanding who I'm hiring. And geeks tend to be exceedingly allegiant to folks that treat them right. So is every geek, is every geek great? No. Is somebody going to go rogue? Yeah. But it's also the organization's job and the guy at the top, the CIO, CISO, whatever the, however their structure is, to be able to do re-vetting, re-profiling, and keeping up, especially on your mission, critical people that where you have root control. And root control is one of the worst things this industry's got. I can't believe we still have root. It's astounding to me. Other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Blackmail. Yep. Yep. Would you, be, would you go to David Piraeus if you were cute? <laughs> I'm, wait a minute, you're going to drug policy and whores. Wait a minute, how do you do this in one breath? <laughs> All right, you're not passing any polys. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, there was, you know, this is, this is part of what the alleged, alleged poly lifestyle is for, is to find out what it is you do wrong that you could be blackmailed for, is allegedly part of it. And uh, a lot of that has to do with relationships, and I'm going back to psychological vetting. Where is your button? All right, uh, we, now we just found out you're having an affair. Would you want it made public or not? Maybe you don't give a shit. Maybe you do give a shit. Of course it is. At the time. But see, again, now today, homosexuality is not a discriminator. Alcoholism is not a discriminator. Color blindness is not a discriminator. What? You only do in the United States. You don't, you don't in Europe. In Europe, it's a sign of pride. It, it's a, you're expected to have a mistress. Now, whether that's okay with your wife, at, maybe your wife goes in with the poly with you. I don't give a shit if that is going to become an issue. I mean, it's got to become, a, he has a legitimate point. That is, what, where is your tipping point? I don't know how to structure the questionnaires properly. That's what these guys, you know, the Ekmans and these other folks do. Where do they find, what are the right questions to elicit those responses? I don't know the answers, but please visit paulekman.com. I mean, the answers are out there. Yes? Sure. Mm -hmm. Ninth Circuit Court, yes. Right. You've taken one bullet point and said, and I fully agree that there is so much underneath of it. I mean, I have touched on, you know, I mean, we could go on for weeks in this and try to come up with an agreement, and we probably would not come up with an agreement. Or well, maybe geeks could. Again, we're, I don't want to drill down on any one issue with an answer because that's what off time and bar time is for. Yes, sir. Of the Kickstarter project, ultimately, it's to get at least a million free books on cyber safety, security, and ethics into K-12. to I did the first round of it in 2002, and I paid for it all myself. We were able to distribute about a, a little over 100,000 copies before anybody really gave a shit about it. Now, allegedly, a lot of people give a, give a shit about it. And so we decided to do it on Kickstarter this time instead of me pouring out all the money because I don't have that money. We, we, we lost money in the crush. <laughs> we hold it, yes? Sue, hire a lawyer and sue him. I don't fucking know. I don't have all those answers. I'm not saying I have the answers to everything at all. I have a lot of the questions. I think I got the bullet points. Um, are you happy where you work? Where do you work? What's the name of the company? What's the address? <laughs> in a medical environment, there's actually, there's, you can, they can actually make cases uh, in certain health environments. I know certain cooking environments. Uh, yeah, that's why the hairnet issues. And now, uh, I mean, you got the gloves. I mean, when I grew up, I mean, gloves, touch, hamburgers, the hell with that, slop it on. I mean, if you're in New York and you get your fist food on Broadway, that's mystery meat and God knows where the hands have been. 
So, yeah, no, there are certain areas where there are legitimate reasons for things, and I'm not even going to attempt to argue against those. But I'm arguing from a high-level geek standpoint, uh, are the discriminators such that they're unable to actually defend themselves? And when we're talking about what Napolitano has been saying, that we need 30,000 people, we can't find them, and I, I'm just calling bullshit on it. There's 30,000 people in this country that will, can do the job if you will allow them and restructure yourself. It's um, one of the quotes that came out of one of the articles that ca came out of this whole discussion, and I wish I could take credit for it, but it said, what we're looking for are people with black hat skills with white hat backgrounds. And it's not a bad quote. Yes, sir. Um, oddly enough, uh, at the DHS, uh, as w when the stop drug testing came up, there was a standing round of ovation, surprisingly enough. Uh, at the FBI, about half of the audience gave me a round of applause for that one slide alone. Um, because a number of these groups are geek-oriented, and the FBI group I was dealing with wasn't just guys carrying guns, a lot of the cybercrime units and such and they understand some of these things perhaps better. Uh, and when you look at, we'll take the FBI and the drug thing, uh, after was it Oregon, no, not Oregon failed, Washington and Colorado won, and every police department is going, hell yes. Uh, when you look at the drug law changes that they're trying to make more draconian in Holland right now, the, uh, they're trying to go back and emulate more of what the US is doing after, what, 15, 20 years of liberalization, the biggest group against them is law enforcement. Be That's the, allegedly what they're trying to do, but we, you, get a, you, you get a very different story when you hear the politicians versus hearing the law enforcement officials in Holland. I was just in Holland doing some work this, uh, so I mean it's a whole different story because crime is down. And what is going to happen is if they do what they plan on doing, it's going to put pot back into the hands of the hard drug dealers and ecstasy and cocaine and heroin dealers on the streets of the North Africans that are building uh, their own drug infrastructure in Holland. Sorry? Yeah, because of that, absolutely. A absolutely correct. Absolutely. Yes, sir. What would, be, what would be my suggestion? Do you, do, you have the, do you have the chutzpah to try something different? Okay, here's what you do. Here's what you do. Go to Craigslist. Bring in your own 10 pre-qualified people. That's not what I said. I said, do you have the balls to try something different? Go to Craigslist. Go get your own people. Go make your own decisions before you even touch HR. And I mean, you have going outside the channels, finding a friendly lawyer. And what is going? I actually have a couple of cyber geeks out of the Department of Justice. I'm talking with now about who's going to get sued first. We we're looking at having some test cases for people that, whether they're existing inside of an organization, feeling discriminated against for some of these, unable to get hired for some of these reasons, and trying a couple test cases. Because test cases, unfortunately, in this country are still the way to get the law changed. Not that I particularly like it, but it's the mechanism. Can you speak up so everyone can hear you? Stay All right. I, don't, I mean, I'm, most geeks I know like people smarter than them so they can learn. No, we had the management slide up there earlier. I mean, how many geeks really want to be management? You know, may, maybe over a team of eight or ten, but not up at this level. The gentleman said paradigm shift, uh, think shift. I fully agree. And it's, is this going to happen overnight? No. I mean, 30 years ago, I said we're going to go to war using cyber weapons between countries, and they said I was nuts. So 30 years later, we're doing it. Now, is this going to change overnight? No. 
do I, can I hope to get you to change one thing, him to try something, somebody else to try something else, to think about it, to have the debate? I've never said when I speak I'm right. Only thing I hope is that I'm enough of an asshole and I present it well enough that it'll give you something to discuss and try. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, sir. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> All right, I don't want to eat up the next guy's session, but I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Cheers. Thanks.